Of the millions of moments you live in this beautiful life, you never know what moments are going to remain with you. Often the things that stick are small things, moments you'd never peg as being important or memorable at the moment you're immersed in them. And then one afternoon, 20 years on, or 30, or 40, or even 50 years drift past, and you catch yourself daydreaming once again about that Saturday afternoon your father took you with him to the place where he worked. If you're the type of person given to wondering about these kind of things, you might wonder what it was about that afternoon that draws you back to it over the years. Or maybe you aren't that kind of person at all and you think about it from time to time and then shrug it off and return to the dishes or the garden or whatever it was that you happened to be doing when the memory tugged you away. Whenever Dave thinks about Art Gillespie, the thing he inevitably returns to is a baseball game on a Sunday afternoon in 1966. Or sometimes he starts thinking about that ball game and it's the ball game that leads him to Art rather than the other way around. Big Narrows, Miners, versus the Bedeck Junior All-Stars, Dave playing left field, Art Gillespie coaching, Kevin Campbell sliding into third base called out, and Art's exploding off the bench and storming towards the third base umpire, Scotty LeBlanc, looking for all the world like he's going to slug him. Scotty owned and operated Scotty LeBlanc's Academy of Music over Jacobson's Ladies' Wear, and Scotty happened to be teaching Art's daughter, Millie, the clarinet that spring. So when Scotty looked around and saw Art steaming towards him with his fists clenched, he almost fainted. Art's face all red and forward, it looked bad. Until Art drew up, not six feet from where Scotty was standing, looked down at his fists and then up at Scotty and shook his head like he was trying to clear it. Like he was surprised to find himself halfway to third base. And he abruptly spun around and walked back to the bench without saying a word dropped down beside Dave and said, you don't have a chocolate bar, do you, Davey? <laughs> it, was, it was a most unart-like moment. Art didn't get angry. Art didn't raise his voice. Dave looked at him, his eyes as big as saucers, shook his head. No, he said, I don't have any chocolate, Art. Art said, don't worry, it doesn't matter. And he spat on the ground. Art Gillespie, third generation owner operator of the Big Narrows Ice Company. Born in March of 1917 on the farm where he spent his boyhood and all his adult life. The farm nestled in the maple bush at the base of Macaulay's Hill. Art Gillespie, son of Norm. Norm who ran the ice company before Art took it on. Norm who used to drink with the great pilot Johnny McCurdy. In fact, Eight years before Art was born, his daddy Norm used the Big Narrows ice sleigh to drag the Silver Dart, the biplane that made the first powered flight in the British Empire, onto the ice of Bedeck Bay. Norm was, in fact, standing beside Graham Bell the moment the airplane bounced twice and lifted off the ice, took flight. Art Gillespie actually flew with Jack McCurdy when he was a boy, five years old, 1922. McCurdy took Art up the day his father took him and his brother to Bedeck for Bell's funeral. Art Gillespie, who everyone said could have played ball in the big leagues, he had a tryout with Boston and was offered a contract, but he didn't sign. A month after he came home, they even sent someone, a scout or someone, all the way to the Narrows from Boston to try and talk him into changing his mind. It was just a minor league contract, said Art, when Dave asked him about it that spring that Kevin Campbell was called out sliding into third base, and Art asked Dave for the chocolate bar. Dave never saw Art play ball, but he saw him play golf. Art hit the ball long and straight and easy, just like you would have thought. Art and his plaid shirts. Art and his suspenders. Art and his dog. Art always traveled with a dog at his knees. He had one, a, a Sheltie who used to chew tobacco. <laughs> Kept chewing even after Art himself quit. <laughs> Art who moved around town as if he were connected to it by a big elastic band. You couldn't imagine Art leaving the Narrows. He'd be snapped back if he went too far. In some ways, he was the town. 
In some ways, you got the feeling that if he left, everyone would have to go. Art, who started delivering ice when he was 13 years old in the days when everyone in town depended on the Gillespies. They had a team of blind horses that pulled the ice wagon in those days, two old pit ponies who knew the route so clean that Art and his brother would jog along beside the wagon working either side of the street, and the horses knew when and where to stop without anyone telling them. Art, who had worked with the horses and could show you a photo of a clipper ship loading up with ice his grandfather had cut out of the Brador Lake, bound for Europe. Cape Breton ice, boy, going to Paris. Art, who had kept the ice business going, bought an ice-making machine when refrigeration came in and delivered bags of Big Narrows ice cubes as far away as Sydney. He kept harvesting a few hundred pounds of ice out of the lake every January just because... But he wasn't sentimental about it. He loved the new machine. He'd reach into the freezer and pull out a handful of ice cubes and hold them up the way a grain farmer might hold up a handful of prize seed. And he'd pop an ice cube in his mouth and he'd suck on it and he'd pull it out and he'd say, now that's beautiful ice. You put that in a glass of water and it would just shimmer. It's so clear it would disappear. When he got the ice machine, he bought a storefront on the main street right between the Maple Leaf restaurant and Judy's sewing shop. And he opened up a laundromat in front, and he had the ice machine in a, in a room at the back. Same business, he said, just add water. <laughs> Art, who lived for ice, went to Florida once a year with Betty, his wife. The first time they went was on a bus tour. First stop, Memphis. When Dave asked him about Memphis, all Art said was the ice was cloudy. <laughs> they don't know how to make decent ice down there. He didn't like Orlando either. Shopping malls everywhere. But he liked Cape Canaveral, and he liked the beach. First thing I did, he said, was make a snow angel in the sand. <laughs> Art. There are people you meet when you're a child, school teachers, coaches, store owners, people who you orbit when you're small and without much gravity, people who influence the way you travel for the rest of your life. Art Gillespie was such a person for Dave. Art, who had been around long enough to remember the year his family got the first radio in Big Narrows, 1928. You had to use earphones to listen, and Art loved to tell a story about how, on account of the earphones, he was the only person in the house, in fact, the only person in Big Narrows, to hear the report about the abnormally high tides in the Thames River in London, England. <laughs> tides so high they were threatening to overflow and burst the riverbanks. He was 11 years old, and they'd only had the radio three days, and he was unaccustomed to the conventions of the medium and he got the Thames River in London, England, muddled with the Thamesville Creek, which ran through the Narrows. <laughs> and Art was convinced the entire town was going to be swept away. And he insisted on sleeping in the attic for three nights. And his mother let him because, because he was so intense about it. Though he wouldn't tell her why. He just didn't see the point in getting everyone worked up. Two years before the, the Great Flood, as he came to call it, two years before that, when Art was nine years old, Princess Elizabeth was born, also in London. And somehow Art got her muddled up with Elizabeth McLeod, the grocer's daughter, who was born the same week. Art was 11 before he worked out that Elizabeth McLeod, the grocer's daughter from Big Narrows and a bit of a butterball, wasn't going to be queen one day. Art. Art Gillespie, dead now a year and a half. And whenever Dave thought about that baseball game in 1966 when Kevin Campbell was called out sliding into third base, he'd start thinking about Art, about the Great Flood, and about Elizabeth McLeod, and about how the kids from the Narrows used to meet the kids from Lindquist on Saturday nights and they'd have dances on the bridge. Art met Betty at one of those bridge dances, walking my baby back home on a wind-up gramophone. Art Gillespie gone. Who could believe it? Dave couldn't. 
He'd, he'd, he'd think about these things and he'd inevitably end up at the same place, feeling a rush of panic that he'd never see art again. It felt like claustrophobia and then the panic would morph into anxiety. He started to worry because he couldn't remember what color Art's eyes were. Now that was a stupid thing to get upset about, but there was nothing he could do about it. It upset him. Now, now I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this because Dave got a letter from Art's wife this week. And I have it here with me, and I thought it would interest you. Dear David, I'm writing to thank you for your kind letter which you sent last year when Art passed on. I feel awful that I haven't replied until now, but at first I didn't feel up to writing and then I kept putting it off. I never seemed to have the time, or the right time, I guess. But I have as much time as anyone else, so that's no excuse. Please accept my apologies. I hope you understand. Art always had a fond spot for you, David. I wonder if you know that Millie wasn't our only child. Did you know we also had a son, Jack? Jack died in 1955 of polio when he was nine years old. You must have been four or five years younger than Jack, but I think when Art looked at you, he thought of our son. You had the same coloring. I think watching you grow gave him a special pleasure. He always spoke warmly of you. When Art learned he had cancer, they told him he had only lived three months. He came back from Halifax after the first treatment, and he told me they were wrong. He told me he had three years in him, and he was right. He lived three years and two weeks after we learned he was sick, and I think we did all right. We did the best we could anyhow. Remember how we used to go to Florida? We used to have such a grand time. Art was too sick that last April to go. He wasn't getting around much anymore. He couldn't even play his guitar. Time was coming when we normally went, and he was depressed, and one night he said, I can't go. And I said, yes, you can. And I paid for four seats so he could lay down across three of them. The first night we stayed in a hotel in Orlando, and then I drove us to Clearwater the next morning. That was the first time I'd ever driven in Florida. Your mother thought I was crazy. She asked me what I was going to do if he died in Florida. I told her I'd buy a backpack and have him cremated and bring him home on my back. <laughs> I wasn't going to sit around the narrows and wait. We had a wonderful time. We rented a room on the beach and I put one of those lawn chairs out on the deck and he could see the water and hear the wind in the palms. He was too sick to do anything else, but at least he was warm. At least he was in Florida. And I didn't have to buy the backpack, thank God. I guess it was while we were in Florida that I really understood he was going to die. I guess that's when I figured out there were no emergencies anymore. We were beyond emergencies so we might as well travel. We'd always talked about when we retired how we'd spend some money and go to one of those fancy resorts, the Celtic Lodge or Digby Pines or someplace like that. Two weeks before Art died, he said, well, I guess we're never going to do that. And I said, yes, we are. We're going to spend that money right now. We're going to go somewhere where we can hear loons at night. He said, I can't even get downstairs. How are we going to do that? His liver was so enlarged he was having trouble sitting up. Well, I told him in all those years that I'd been a nurse, I'd never heard of anyone living longer by sitting in one place and holding their breath. <laughs> so I bought a blow-up mattress and a line of that yellow plastic rope, and we went. We had our 48th anniversary on the lake. They gave us a cottage right next to the dining room, and I pulled him between the cottage and the lodge on that air mattress. <laughs> I guess by then we'd arrived at a place where we realized we'd have to choose between our dignity and doing something we were going to enjoy. So we gave up our dignity, and it wasn't hard. I dragged him down to the water in the morning and would have a visit with this nice couple from Saskatchewan and watch their kids swim. And I'd pull him back down there in the afternoon and would watch the fishermen come in and see what everyone had caught. Mostly I read to him on the balcony, and I'd lie beside him and keep him company. And when he went to sleep, I'd work on the mattress. By the end of the week, it was pretty much all covered in duct tape. 
As I said, he died two weeks later, and I'm glad we went. I'm sorry you couldn't have been here for the service. The church was full, but the house was some empty that night when I came home. I don't think I'll ever get used to that. It doesn't worry me anymore, though you do funny things sometimes. A couple of months after he died, I got up one morning and I set his place for breakfast. And still sometimes I'll be on my way home and I'll see something and I'll think to myself that I have to tell Art about that and then I'll remember, don't be silly. We used to read to each other at night before we went to sleep. When he died, we were about a third of our way through a book of Alistair MacLeod's short stories. The night we buried him, I couldn't settle because the book wasn't finished. So I went up to Art's grave with a lawn chair and a flashlight and the book, and I read to him. After I was there a while, I heard a, a rustling, so I turned off the flashlight. It was deer. Three deer moving from grave to grave, eating the flowers. <laughs> they'd stop by a stone and eat all the cedar and the greenery, and then they'd move on to the next one. It was the most calming thing I ever saw, watching nature come out and seeing how life goes on. Those three deer picnicking on all those flowers. I went up there with my chair and my flashlight and my book every night for a week and a half. About the third night, I found a baggie on his grave with a letter in it and a picture. I picked it up. It was from Norm Lantier, but I didn't read it. I guess Norm had something he wanted to say to Art, and I figured it was none of my business. Art was a good friend to so many people. They'd call him and talk things over with him. I guess other people saw that letter during the day because before the week was over, the letters started to multiply. Eventually, the groundskeeper actually put a box out for them. It must have been well over 50. I never read one of them, though I did put your letter there. You had so many nice things to say, I hope you don't mind. It's funny the things you do and the things you miss. Art and I used to have a little ritual if one of us was frosted about something and we couldn't sleep. I can't even remember how it began. I think it was something left over from his childhood. In any case, when someone was peeved up or things were rough, the other one would fix a snack. And it was always the same snack a Cadbury fruit and nuts chocolate bar, two glasses of milk, and a candle. And we always ate it in bed. We usually kept a chocolate bar handy in case of an emergency. <laughs> but once or twice when we didn't have one on hand, Art went out and got one late and brought it home and we'd have our little picnic. About three months after he died, I was cleaning behind the bed and I found a bar hidden on his side of the headboard. We have a pier bed with a dresser and mirrors on either side and cubby holes, and I found it tucked at the back of one of his cubby holes. It really tied my buns in a knot. I wanted to have a picnic right then and there, but I, I didn't have my partner. I must have cried over that stupid chocolate bar for three months. And then one night, I finally decided I either had to eat it before the worms got to it, or I had to throw it out. So I decided to have a picnic on my own. I went downstairs and I got the tray out and a candle and a glass of milk and I fixed everything just right and I came upstairs and I got into bed and I opened up the chocolate bar and there was no chocolate in it. <laughs> Art had eaten the chocolate bar and folded up Kleenex to make it look like it was still there. <laughs> and he wrapped it all up and inside there was a note. Sorry, love, but I was hungry. <laughs> it was truly delicious. Love you, tee hee, Art. Well, I'd bawled over that chocolate bar for weeks, and now here I was bawling again, and all I had was a handful of Kleenex to wipe my nose with. I knew I had to do something with it, and I got up and I wrapped it up just the way Art had, and I put on my jacket over my nightie and I went out to the garage and I got a rose stick and I nailed the wrapper to the rose stick and then I drove up to the cemetery and I hammered the sucker in right beside his tombstone. <laughs> and I laughed and I laughed while I did it. 
On the way home, I stopped at McLeod's and I bought myself a hazelnut bar. I never really liked the fruit and nuts bar all that much. I didn't favor the raisins. But Art did, and I never said anything. So I bought the hazelnut bar, and I had a hazelnut picnic. And I was still laughing. Sat in bed eating that chocolate bar, laughing so hard there were tears coming down my face. I put up a tree this Christmas that couldn't last year. And when I pulled out the decorations, I found a Christmas stocking that he had packed for me. I guess he must have packed it the autumn before he died. I guess he knew he wasn't going to make it to Christmas. There was a bag of marshmallows that were as hard as a rock, and a necklace, and a Cadbury's fruit and nut chocolate bar, and 50 American dollars. He always gave me that at Christmas, and I'd use it in Florida to take him out to dinner. My favorite thing, however, was a picture frame. He gave me a gold picture frame with his picture in it, and I'm looking at it as I write this letter. Engraved on the back of the frame, it reads, Love is patient, and love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and love never ends. You have been more than patient to read these old woman's ramblings. I just wanted to thank you for writing. I'd love to see you the next time you come home. His eyes were blue. Yours sincerely, Betty Gillespie. Dave said he cried when he read that letter. And that night, he received it. He gave it to Morley when they were in bed. And when she finished it, she looked at him, and she had tears in her eyes. But Dave was ready for that, smiling at her, holding out a Cadbury's fruit and nut bar. LAUGHTER